Um, starting the October 19th meeting of the Roxbury, Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors meeting at 6.34. Um, first call to order is public comment. I definitely see we have some members of the public. I definitely see some of them look like track folks. Um, so please, if we have some folks on the line as well. Um, so if you do want to make public comment, uh, please go ahead and line up um, in order and announce your name quickly. And also just, uh, we don't want to cut anyone short, but um, we have heard a lot about this, so you can keep your statements brief if, if you want to. Um, we're pretty aware of the issues and, and definitely know that, that it has a lot of support. So, uh, Tim, okay, yep. go for it. So. <clears throat> I taped it out, so it's real short and sweet. Perfect. And announce your name, please. Just Tim Noir. So I wrote, I'm here just as a show of support for moving the track project forward. My concern is that if we continue to linger on the realm of all possibilities, we'll inevitably have the choices made for us by circumstance. I work in facilities. I know how this works. I feel like if we continue to to contemplate the possibilities that we're going to end up having a circumstance where this is no longer going to be possible and I feel like that that's going to be a huge loss and a huge opportunity um, for the children and for the community. So I'm here to support moving this thing forward. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Doug. Um, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, I'm Anna Noir, I'm in eighth grade, and I've been on the track team for three years. And we're like the only, one of the only schools that has a dirt track, and it gets muddy. Like, we have to paint the lines, and if it rains, then we have to redo it the next day. And it takes a lot of effort, and it would be really helpful if we just had like a track that was already done, and we would be faster. Like, the first, in sixth grade, we were undefeated, and we had like, a dirt track. So if we had like now if we had like a better track, then we could have like maintained our undefeated score through the next year. And it just helps people like connect and it's like it's a fun program. So I'm in favor of it. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Hey folks, Jim Mike and Barry, I'll try to be brief as well. And you all have seen my email. Um, obviously, also in support of the track project, moving it forward. Kind of echoing what Tim said, I worry a little bit about analysis paralysis, that if we keep thinking about other things that we also need to consider at a certain point, we might always have to spend another year thinking about it and then spend another year thinking about it, and then there'll be cost increases, and then at a certain point, we move on to other things and it never happens. So I hope that if, well, I'd love for you all to say, hey, let's go for it, but I understand too that that might not happen this evening. So what I would really love to understand and have clarified if we can't move forward and make great things happen is knowing from you all, either individually or collectively, what, what that good enough information is that you need in order to then make a decision. Because we're never going to have perfect information. There's always going to be a thousand other reasons to never build the track and to spend those funds on something else for the school. That's just reality. So what good enough information do you need? And then when you have it, maybe it's tonight, maybe it's in a week, maybe it's in a year, then you can say, now I'm ready to vote. And not, oh, but now we need to know this. And now we need to know this. So I think criteria that clarifies process and decision making. And it's also going to be important because we as parents are going to then try to explain to our kids if it's happening, great, and what it might entail, or if it's not happening yet, when the board might know enough in order to make a decision to decide if it is ever going to happen or not. So I, I, I would really appreciate that clarity. Um, and I'll leave it at that, and thanks again for every just being here and caring. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. That's right. Hi, my name is Ezra Merrill Triplett. Uh, I'm the, one of the team captains for Montpelier Cross Country and Track and Field. We've been running on this nice track uh, since middle school, um, and I've been advocating for a new track. I guess it's the second year now. Um, 
Yeah, it's, we're the capital. It feels like we should have a better facility than this. I mean, we could host the state meet if we did. And it just seems kind of like a waste having just this track. I mean, we have such a big middle school. Our high school is expanding too, just team members and cross country and track and field. And really feels like we should have a bigger facility and just higher quality in general. Thank you. Thanks, Ezra. Beth? Hi, y'all. Thanks again for all of your service for being here every other week. Um, I'm Beth Merrill. I'm here <coughs> as a parent of both a middle school and high school student um, of kids who have participated in track and cross country. Um, for each of my kids, running has meant something different. Um, I think it's the, the diversity of what this sport offers is, is really amazing. Um, for one, it's a calling that shaped his middle school and high school teenage existence. Um, and for another, it's finding grit and learning how to do hard things um, in a way that I wasn't able to teach. Um, and beyond my own kids, I now teach uh, Spanish at the uh, middle school. And I also supervise sixth grade lunch and recess. <laughs> and um, <Thank> you. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. And I see the kids at the middle school with their track jackets and just their level of pride at being part of at being of being part of something, being part of a team. Um, and I think that you know, track and running sports offer that individual. You know, for kids who being on a team or you know, paying for club sports is not an option, this is, this is a place where they can find a place um, you know, in throwing and a jumping and a running. Um, and they can hop in in middle school or hop in in high school and still have success. Um, so as a teacher, and with the issues that I see there, I feel like the greatest need of these kids right now is to learn, again, how to be together in a supervised recreational environment for a common good, um, toward a common goal. And track and field provides that opportunity for so many kids. And I think, I just feel that our kids now merit a facility that's safe and new where that community can happen. So thank you again for considering. Thanks, Beth. Hey. Nathan? I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, I'm Nathan Souter. I'm a parent of a high school student and a middle school student. I'm obviously a resident and I'm also the middle school track and field coach. And as always, I want to thank you all for the work you do and the in kind of uncountable hours you put in. Um, I took some time this afternoon to read through the facilities uh, report that I think Andrew LaRosa and staff must have prepared in advance of this meeting tonight. And I was struck once again by the maturity with which our district goes about so many pieces of what you do. Um, you know, the capital fund that, that is now part of our practice every year and, and the approach to, hey, we know, that, uh, we know that roofs cost a lot of money, so let's plan ahead for when we're going to need a new roof. And, you know, looking back at recent improvements on heat pumps or redoing the softball field, and it just strikes me that this is a, this is a district that behaves responsibly to its facilities and to its community by thinking ahead and planning ahead and then making things happen. And I look at the track out there and I think about when was the last time that had any TLC or attention. And we now have tons and tons and tons of kids be, uh, performing in these programs using that facility. And I think um, if we put that, you know, we, you have all already committed a significant amount of funds for it. If we move on that now, then that's resolved and you can look ahead to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, which is evident in Andrew's report and is evident in all of your thinking. And so I just, I hope we can get to yes on the track project, move forward with that, and then look ahead with pride, knowing that you take this very deliberate approach to everything that you do. So thank you, I hope you can get to yes. Great, thanks Evan. Anyone else in the in-person audience? Thank you. Um, looks like we have Tracy on Zoom. Tracy? And again, restate your name, please. Hello? Hello? Oh, at least it does. Okay. And may read. Okay. So we'll do Tracy, Lisa, and then may read. Thank you. Resident. Thank you. Thank you for taking my comments. Yeah. I just want to say that the COVID pandemic, 
forbid this air We need to do the clean, clean the air um, and make that ventilation a priority. Right now, the schools only have MERV 10s, and that's not going to be sufficient to do with the size of the SARS-2 like kill the virus. Currently, as of today, we have 66 current hospitals age with six people in the ICU. Uh, there's an 18% positive seven-day average, and not too long ago, at 5%, they said that would be uncontrolled spread. And it's a severe undercount by at least four to five times. We had 112 cases today. Uh, 85 of them are confirmed by PCR, which is very difficult to get. 27 are probable. That's the antigen tests. People are not reporting their antigen tests. I know people myself who are not reporting them. We need to actually avoid infections. And to do that, we need to clean the air. Kids do get sick. And there are long-term consequences to that. Um, it's not the acute infection that people are worried about, especially with the vaccine vaccinations. It's the silent, quiet, longer term damage that's being done. The endothelial damage, the vascular damage, the neurological damage, the immune system damage. There are hundreds, if not thousands of uh, journal articles out there that's done by the scientific community and a quick search on PubMed or anything like that will bring you that information. This is actually a very severe thing just because the kids are being affected, but you might not see it right away, but it's going to affect them in the long term for the rest of their lives, as well as the adults who work in the system. And if anybody wants any of the articles that I have, I, you know, please contact me. Um, and that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. And we're ready for you. Yeah. It's like, yeah, Lisa B, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I lost connection for a moment. Okay. Um, I'm going to swim upstream um, and say that um, I, I want to first thank the school board for representing all of our district students, their families, and taxpayers as you consider the particulars of spending. Your votes will reflect your prioritization of the elements of public education. We're now in the midst of the greatest educational losses in the history of American public education. Correction of these losses will cost us in the Montpelier Roxbury School District millions of dollars over the next several years. Two of our four buildings are dilapidated. The high school will require a new roof in the next five years. We're scheduled for PCB testing in all four buildings. This will likely increase our woes. And the school board has publicly committed to making our facilities green. These projects combined with many others will cost our school district many, many, many millions of dollars in the next several years. So getting to the two to five million dollar track proposal, I make the following observations. Athletics are rightly highly valued in our society. And the importance of team sports to the able in our school district should not be underestimated. However, only approximately 20% of our entire school population participates in school athletics in any given year. 
So I asked the school board if you can publicly justify spending two to five million dollars for a track for the few when we have existential issues with our buildings and with our academics that affect a hundred percent of our students. And if you can justify that spending, how much other funding will be left to future taxpayer bonds? Thank you. All right, thank you, Lisa. Uh, looks like we have married. Hi. Would you all mind the phone the really? There's something. Yeah, there's but something MHS going on at home. Phone. Can you mute the MHS mic? There's something going on for people at home. Yeah. Oh, is it near the fan? No, I think there's a feedback. <laughs> okay. I think it's getting me talking back into it. Is yeah. that, I don't know if it's echoing in your own, but for me, like every. Is that going? We, we can hear yeah. you clearly. Yeah, Anna's saying the same thing. I, okay. right. I can't hear you anymore, but give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes. OK, all right. Thank you for your patience. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Marie Harris, and I'm a Montpelier resident former middle school teacher, um, current assistant coach um, for both middle school track and cross country um, here in Montpelier. Um, and I just wanted to add on to um, all of what's been said by some of our athletes today and also other coaches and parents of the team. Um, I don't have any kids myself, um, but helping out with coaching the team, I can just see how incredibly dedicated the coaches and all of the athletes are to this program and seeing how much it has grown um, in the past few years and how much um, how much community support there is behind the program. It would be really fantastic to get these folks a, a proper facility. Um, I did cross country and track growing up as an uncoordinated teenager and for someone who ball sports were not really an option, um, I've always really appreciated how track and cross country both are welcoming to all different types of students, something that is super important um, when we're looking at sort of the scope and the breadth of offerings in the school community, that it really is a place for everybody and students can be there taking the athletic component of it as seriously as they want to. Um, they're getting the socialization, they're getting fresh air, they're getting exercise. Um, all of these things in a semi semi structured environment that is substantively different from the rest of their school day um, and the type of interactions they're having with their peers during the school day and that kind of slight uh, slightly less structured environment um, that still has adults monitoring and managing um, young people, especially adolescents, is so important for their kind of well-rounded growth um, outside of just academics. So um, just adding my two cents that I would really love to see us be able to host some more um, you know, substantive meets, maybe even states um, here in their capital city, and also for our practices uh, to have, have students, both middle school and high school, be able to you know, really have facilities that um, allow them to train and be ready for competition and see their growth over time. Um, so I hope, thank you all for listening very much, for considering it. I know you're weighing a lot, um, but wanted to throw in my additional support for moving forward with the track, pro um, with the track proposal. Thank you. Thank you, and I th think I don't see anyone else. Um, no? Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for the thoughtful comments, uh, and we will be getting to that discussion in just a moment after we go through the consent agenda and then hear from, um, uh, from Merrick and Zach. Um, so consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'm pulling up, we had language that we have to add the, On the to warrant. the warrants, so I'm yes. just pulling that language up. Yeah, thank you. So that we include that in the motion. Okay, I move we approve the consent agenda with the inclusion of the 10 14 22 and 9 30 22 uh, actuals warrants for approval. Do you have a second? I'll second it. Uh, any discussion? <coughs> One um, 
sort of thing that I wanted to highlight in the new superintendent report about the data meetings that are very exciting and just wondering if there is going to be any sort of like high level, I know that individual student data cannot be shared with the board or the public, but um, will there be any sort of high level reporting out of those? I believe, if you look on the yearly thing, it's next board meeting. Great, yeah. I have a follow up question to that. Is that going to, when you went, will that presentation have that data connected to the continuous improvement plan? Yes. Awesome. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. Uh, American Zach, um, yeah, I've got so a presentation, it's like. I, I shared the presentation with um, Anna and Libby's. Yeah, it looks like it. Libby is pulling it up right now. Oh, you know what? Anna, you're gonna have to pull it up because my Zoom on this computer isn't working to share my screen for some reason. Maybe you're not co-host right now. No, it's something, I switched computers no. and it's something with the actual computer that's not letting me do it. It doesn't, it doesn't like your new computer. You see it, see it? Oh yeah, it's weird. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's uh, is Anna able to do it? Can Anna hear you? She should be able to hear me. Yeah, our mic's we, on now. Our mic is back on? Yes. Well, we're not muted anyway. Yeah. Right. I can see us. Amanda, can you share the students, or Amanda, I just saw Amanda jump on. Anna, can you share the uh, student presentation from your end? My computer's not letting me do it. We can also just read through it. There's not a lot of visual. Go for it. it. Go for it and start it, and then, okay. and then Anna will catch up. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. So this is student representative board address for October 19th. Alrighty, so good evening everyone. Um, me and Zach just have a short update tonight. As always, we'll start off with some current events in the schools, and then we're going to outline our tentative plan for, um, the, for new student representatives or future student representatives and clarifying the process that we thought about around that. And in tandem with that, we're going to share our thoughts for the formation of a student school board subcommittee. So I'll let Zach take it away with current events. Totally. So some current events at MHS is Harvest Fest is this Thursday, and then um, Show Choir will be performing there, but also November 3rd, 7 p.m. on the MHS stage, there will be a performance. Would you guys mind telling us what the Harvest Fest is? Yeah, so um, essentially it's a celebration of, of fall, har fall like, you know, a fall celebration, and on Harvest Fest, the, the day itself, there's all these activities that various staff and teachers and other community individuals put on, and then all these students get to engage in these really cool events, and, and teachers too. So I don't know. There's like singing, and yeah. it's a huge yeah. meal together. And Food, yeah. It's like a full day event here at the high school tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah. Super fun. Really fun. Alrighty, so moving on to the, our, our plan for future student representatives. And for some context, over the past month or so, me, Zach, Emma, and Matt McLean here at the high school have all been corresponding and thinking about how we can you know, clarify the process for future representatives on this, on this board, student representatives, that is. And tentatively, a rough outline of what we've decided on is full year terms, staggering appointments into two periods so that there's always a member who can help guide another incoming student representative. And along with that, we're planning to stick with appointments for now, but we are interested in moving toward elections in some capacity, and we're still figuring out what that would be, but that's something to note. And we also thought that offering a, a small financial incentive to these student representatives might help encourage a greater diversity of applicants. And as we talk about in the subcommittee section of our presentation, we think that the creation of a student-led subcommittee of the school board would be a great way to engage both students in the school, um, in school board affairs, as well as help student representatives expand their you know, research and reach in regards to um, you know, their capacity to do research and so forth. So, we also came to a bit of an agreement on making the next appointment for a new rep this spring, 
That way that rep will get a little experience over the summer and then can help guide the rep in the fall accordingly. This is all just a, a bit of a tentative plan we have, but um, it was what we all came up with together, so yeah. And then more about the student school board sort of subcommittee um, that Merrick mentioned is we want to begin the process of forming a student representative-led school board committee, um, like a group of students who are interested um, in how the board works and helping out. Um, we had a lot of different people apply and we talked, we just talked about including everyone um, in, in, into that. Um, and that would serve as a point for getting feedback from everyone, reaching more people, having more like different connections within the community. Um, it could definitely help with research and presentations and getting a view of the whole picture and it would help students engage in the school board process and prepare to be future representatives if that's something they're interested in. And it doesn't, setting up the committee itself doesn't seem too difficult. So <coughs> it's something we're definitely thinking about and we're excited about. Yeah, and um, that's, that's pretty much it actually for tonight. But we're welcome if you guys have any questions or what you guys think about some of the ideas we came up with. Questions for American Zach? Um, yeah, I think this is awesome. Yeah. I thank you for putting in the work, and I missed our meeting with Matt. <laughs> but, it's okay. But I appreciated the minutes and stuff. Um, so, what I think the next steps are the the subcommittee is like the right. And when you say sorry, when you say spring, are you talking about January for a new appointment? We were thinking actually May was the the date we were thinking. Okay. That way. Over the summer. Yeah. Somebody is good. Well, like the process would start more in April, but then the actual appointment would happen in May. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that in May of 2023, we would appoint two people? In May, there would only be one person appointed, and then that way that person can get some experience over the summer and through the end of the year, and then can help guide the appointee in the fall. So oh, then that's, oh, how we, that's how we'd stagger them. I see. Okay. It would be like a spring appointment, then a fall appointment. Yeah. But then moving forward, it would just be in fall. Mm -hmm. And I mean, these dates aren't like official. It could be, it could be even earlier than May. It could be March or anything of the sorts, but okay. yeah. And so the idea would be that we'd have like kind of a senior bringing on a junior and that junior would become a senior and bring on another junior or yeah, junior sophomore just type of thing. Like, um, yeah, that kind of ex experience I would difference. I mean, I don't, I don't know if with staggered starts if that, I think it would have to be a, like a upperclassman and a lowerclassman, otherwise if two seniors were doing it, I don't think that would work. Yeah. So to have the overlap ongoing with a one year term, you would need to have an appointment in May and an appointment in fall. Yes. Right? Not just one in May. So every year there'd be two appointments staggered. Yeah, like two processes. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was like, get one member this May because we have two that are outgoing. Mm -hmm get a new member in May, then get another, our second member in fall, and then the following fall, it would just be one person. Leaving. But then, that, if it's a one-year appointment, if it was a two-year appointment, I can see that, but I, th I thought I heard one-year appointment. So if it's a one-year appointment, to have that staggered, you'd need to have two, one in fall and one in the, I mean, that is another I right. idea, like we, you could appoint the two in the spring or the fall even, and then, um, not have that person start their term officially until the following season. Okay. So or there can be. Can you tell me a little bit about the how it falls with the school board committee, like the student committee that you want to create? Like, like what does that relationship? What does it look like? Well, so hopefully it would be a way to potentially repair future people who are interested in being student representatives. It would, it would be led by the current student representatives and it would be a way for um, those individuals to expand their outreach in the, into the community and expand their capacity for, for research and so forth and just helping those individuals preparing things and, and so forth, I would say. Um, but it, it would still be school board related work. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, okay. thank you. 
if you don't have an answer for this right now, that's totally fine. But I'm curious how you might envision the um, election part of it working. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do, do, I, we talk about this a lot. But yeah. Um, yeah. It would, we definitely want to like work on making the process so we don't have anything set. Um, but we just thought it would be fun to um, and just useful to engage all the community with like um, the school community with the election process. Um, so it's like representatives of of the of MHS um, and just having people be more aware of it. So it would be just like um, I'm trying to remember what we talked about. It was I mean it'd be kind of a tactic almost for like promoting uh -huh. engagement in the school board among students as well as like the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Like, there's all this happening, and then the people who don't win could potentially transfer over to the subcommittee or something. Yeah. And still be engaged. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, for specifically the election itself, we're not really sure on what that might look like. We talked about um, having a, a ballot and so forth, and then having the top four or so people then come to the board for the actual appointments, like a nomination of so, some mm -hmm. kind. We also thought of direct elections, or, um, yeah, I don't know. It's something to consider further. Cool. I'm yeah. really glad you're thinking about it. Yeah, no, lessons in democracy are definitely not bad things. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is next? Like, what? Is there anything that we have to vote on? Is there, like, really? Well, when we said that setting up the subcommittee wouldn't be too difficult, I don't think that it would require board action, actually. I think it would be kind of set up just like any other school extracurricular. So I think, I mean, I could I can talk more with Matt McLean about the official process for that, but I, I don't think it's too complicated. So that would be the next step, setting up the subcommittee officially. Great. Yeah, no, I don't think we need to take action for that either. Uh, we just need to take action for the appointment. So however that process plays out is, you know, we're happy to support and kind of give what we can to make it happen. And also, I just would encourage you to think of the <coughs> subcommittee as being representative of multiple schools. So, not like a Montpelier High School club, right. <laughs> but like, or whatever, that it would be like a district-wide thing that even elementary school kids could partake in. Totally agree. I think that that's like, that'd be so ideal if we could get more diversity of voices besides just high schoolers and mm -hmm. school board work. Yeah, that might be like a great way to establish the mentorships between High schoolers and middle schoolers, middle schoolers and elementary. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, I'm happy to meet with you about sort of moving forward, but it sounds, I mean, you guys are so good at being independent, but we can meet and talk about moving forward All with right. the subcommittee. Great. Yeah. And what I can do to help. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Jill. No, that's right. I just barely raised my hand here. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I like the idea of nomination, like the election and the nominations, because we didn't know you folks. Folks don't know us until we're elected. And it's really important that folks understand the level of commitment. And you were both able to articulate like why you would make excellent candidates. You were able to articulate your communication and your outreach with your peers. And you were able to articulate the understanding of the commitment, right? So I think that is a really important part of the process at some point. You know, we want to make sure folks know what they're getting themselves into, right? And also that they they are able to sort of demonstrate the skills that you folks have had to, to talk to everybody. So, especially if it is like a, a year long thing. Yeah. Just a Kristen. clarifying question. So, if this is getting coordinated through Matt, does that mean that this is being presented as like an opportunity for a flexible pathway, and that you can kind of link? proficiencies to the experience and kind of accomplish some of that work through your participation in either the subcommittee or as student board members? I Possibly. I mean, I know, like in, in debate specifically, they just started doing that for mm -hmm. that club. And um, I'm pretty sure, like, the process for proficiencies and so forth and translating, translating it into credit is pretty independent. It's like, you know, you right, these are the skills I'm going to work on and these are the action steps that I'm going to take with that. Mm -hmm. So maybe, no, I'm not totally sure. But It was discussed with Matt originally when we were talking about yeah. this role. Um, and at that time it was, 
there was it was complicated and it was also like let's think of this as sort of like a separate volunteer effort and not like a school credit thing mm -hmm. um, that there was a conversation I can't remember all the details of the conversation but it was a com conversation about like um, separating it from credit so that it was I don't know like not um, not tied to your transcript and stuff that it was like a separate uh -huh. volunteer activity uh -huh. and I'm not sure what um, where he would stand on that if we repo repost the question now yeah. but we could mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely a good idea mm -hmm. Other comments? Uh, so, what what are the next steps? Are you guys just going to continue to work with Matt? I mean, I think I think it sounds like the board thinks this is a great idea and yeah. continue to work with Matt. I I think that's the next step. Setting up with Matt, like explicitly, how do we create a subcommittee or so forth? There's a group of people. Yeah, we're going from there. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. No, we appreciate it. We appreciate the thought that you guys have given on this. It's. Uh, you know, again, your your contribution to the board have been fantastic, and it's it's really been great to to have you involved. So, and continuing involvement and finding a way to make that more robust is is really important. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Andrew, um, yearly facilities overview. So uh, I wanted to, uh, this is going to be relatively straightforward. Uh, fortunately, you guys uh, saw this back in like March. So we're kind of on the schedule that we should be doing this and presenting this in the fall. So I'm not going to go over too much ground that we already covered a little while ago. But I just kind of, kind of it's more of an update of where we've been since the last time we met and some things and also give an update on some of the larger projects that we already got in the works. Um, so one of the things that we really wanted to do this summer uh, was give everybody some time off, some much deserved and earned time off. So really we didn't get cracking in the schools until um, after July 5th, which was okay. Everybody needed, everybody needed time off. So some of the, the big projects that we uh, tackled here within the district um, was down in Roxbury, we put in heat pumps in five of the cla or three classrooms and the administrative spaces. Uh, that is working well. Uh, we actually um, are going to be integrating them into the new DDC control system that we also installed down there this, this year. So we can go from basically people turning thermostats on their walls to 72 degrees on October 15th and turning them off well, probably never, just one that gets to 72 <laughs> degrees. All year long, all winter long, all breaks long. So now, and not knowing there's a problem until Tina shows up in the morning. Now Tom can, at his home at four o'clock in the morning when he does, check the temperatures in the buildings, he can do that from his home. So it's been, that piece has been great. Uh, again, we're in the process of integrating those systems into the VD to C control system. So that was probably the biggest project we had down at Roxbury. At Union, uh, it was a time for Tara, who's done an amazing job over there, to um, get her feet under her over there and learn the building. And uh, that's not to say that we didn't. Uh, we actually renovated two classrooms, the two that are adjacent to the main office, put in new flooring and lights and paint and, and all that, which was, which was great, um, as well as some other projects. And what Tara and Nikki, Mickey is doing equally as well at Main Street Middle, um, have been doing is there a fresh set of eyes on those buildings. So things that people just accepted as well, that's just the way it is. Mm. They don't have that mentality. If it's when we and Tom uh, has and Tom and I uh, encourage them and expect them to say, hey, this is broken and it needs to be fixed. And we do our time just to have to do that in a timely manner. And just to interrupt you for a second, for our audience at home, Tara and Mickey are head custodians. Yes. Tara is the head custodian at UES, and Mickey's the head custodian at MSMS, and Tom is our custodial supervisor in charge of everybody whose office is here, but he's all around the district. Correct. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> um, at Main Street, we the big projects that took place, the big project that took place there was the Shine Space, which was actually an ESSER 
three funded project. Um, and I'll let Libby kind of explain a little bit more what that space is used for if, if people need it. But it's a support, it's a student support space dedicated. Um, Do you want to say a more, Libby, just so people know what the investment's about? I, I don't want to use the wrong terminology as much as anything. It's for kids who need a space to, to um, regulate their bodies and, and systems and learn social skills in a more intensive way than other kids do. Right. And we also created, a, a again, a people not using the correct term, but a smaller, um, for lack of a better term, a sensory type space where, some, where we had a swing and things like that. We put appropriate padded flooring down and, and bought the proper equipment for that space as well over there. Mickey also is a stickler. If anyone sees him washing his car twice a week or three times <laughs> a week, knows that he likes things just so. So things like exposed pipes that people just took for granted at Main Street Middle School for however many years that they built a chase almost to the ceiling. We fixed that. We got them all the way to the ceiling. Pipes that were kind of here, we moved to here. Those types of things. Uh, so Main Street is looking great. He also redid the um, some gym storage area and school storage areas. So taking off a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and again, really letting them get to know their buildings. Uh, here at the high school, the biggest project that we took care of this summer was a new DDC control system that now uh, replaced all the valves and all the sensors and we'll have all new thermostats. Those are still in the way that actually have CO detection. So when the room gets stuffy, they automatically open up. All the other buildings already have that. This was the last building that didn't have that. So now we have that in place. Um, the other, we did a few cosmetic things here at the high school, but again, this summer was really kind of catching up and letting the new folks get acclimated to their spaces. Um, with regards to some of the bigger projects that we've talked about over the last couple of years, and I apologize, I don't have my proper glasses. Uh, the heat pumps, we've got a cl couple classrooms that we still have to do down there. The money that was allocated to do that work, there's still money in there. So we should be able to, to finish that, those other rooms. We didn't want to overextend ourselves, um, not knowing where we are. So I'm going to go through this list and I'm going to, I don't, I'll just tell you the funding source and, and where we are with it. So this, the ESSER 3 project for the uh, special ed space at Union Elementary. Uh, we have Katie and uh, Peggy Sue and Jessica um, have met and talked over those spaces. We've also looked at the spaces with the architects back a year or so ago. Katie, myself, and the architects have a meeting in the next week to go through their notes and, and look at that. The multi same, same process with the multi-purpose room over at Union uh, going through. Katie is, is really kind of the lead on that right now of gathering information from her staff on what is needed up there. Again, this, all the spaces have been, uh, we have all the existing drawings done for these spaces and we're really just, we're really now starting to get into the design work. The auditorium renovations, that one we were pretty far along. That's a capital fund project. We were pretty far along with that one last year, um, but we decided to hold on that just because we didn't want to, we didn't want to throw that on Terra. But uh, that one we've, we're going to be, the biggest questions there that we're going to have is whether we restore the seats or replace the seats. And we're also working with uh, Kiana on integrating the back of the house stuff with the, in a, with the front of the house stuff. She has great confidence in the equipment that we took from the high school and what they've got over there. That there really probably isn't going to be a big need for um, a lot of new lighting and things of that nature over there. We're just going to make sure that we integrate what we have uh, wisely. Uh, ESSER 3, Little Jim over at Union. Again, we met with MJ and Mr. Williams, and uh, we're going to go back to them next week with preliminary designs to get their feedback on those projects. Window replacement. I have a meeting with the Montpelier Court Historic Preservation Commission on November 8th. We're going to send them, I'm going to send them for their review, the study that I've done that the Building and Energies Committee has seen looking at the beta test that we did for the windows. This is, their sign off is not required, um, but it's a good, it's good to have their input and make sure that uh, they're on board with it. Also, when we go to do Main Street Middle School windows, those are within Design Review District, so 
it kind of gives them a sense of what we're looking at. So that's moving along. Um, the kitchen and cafeteria renovations, we've met with the architect and, and Jim Birmingham uh, and the mechanic and the pre uh, existing condition drawings have been done. That we're working with uh, kitchen consultants on, on making that work. Um, Main Street Middle School, SR3, the playground, that project, we have done some soil testing over there. We don't expect to find anything, but we should do it now so we, so we can plan for anything. Um, one of the big things that came out of our walk around with Julie over there was um, they we've set up outdoor seating outside the cafeteria at the middle school, and it's been a real hit. Line, but, uh, <laughs> um, it, it alleviates some of the pressures on the on the cafeteria right now. They're doing four seatings over there, so there's a little more elbow room than there used to be uh, within the actual cafeteria. Um, but they like that outdoor seating area, so we want to make that so it's not a mud pit in the well after the second week of school and all the grass is gone. Um, retaining walls, maybe working with the gazebo to make it more of a teaching space some proper seating and really finding some spaces that are appropriate for the youngest fifth grader and the oldest eighth grader. Um, sustainability Lab, that is a capital fund project and that one, we've talked to Julie a little bit about that one and I think that she's, we're thinking that one's probably not gonna take place this summer. Most of the projects that we've talked about so far, I anticipate could take place this coming summer. We have to talk, the principals, and as a big, as a group, need to talk about how much we're tearing apart. Do we stagger it? Do we tear everything apart and get be done with it? Or do we leave the school untouched until next year? The extra three funds need to be spent by next September, by September 24, 24. I think. Okay, sorry, sorry, two summers on. Um, but we'll, that's a logistics thing that we'll, that we'll figure out. But I think Julie also wants to think about that, think more about that as well as there's a new sort of maker space down there and the wood shop is now in a transition. So we have kind of an opportunity to rethink that whole program down there and, and, and what we can make sure that we don't build things twice. So there's some thought on that. Windows at Main Street, again, um, same as this union. We, would, we will get going on union windows first just because that's an easier building to get rolling on. Um, so we'll do that and once we get our feet under us on that one. Uh, we'll decide whether we finish off Union, then move to Main Street, or bring them both up together. Um, three acre stormwater at the high school. So the state has, requires now any, any property over three acres, any business or entity uh, over three acres, and if there's anybody that works in this, forgive me for my using the wrong terms, but basically you have to bring your, your water quality, storm water quality standards up to 50% of what the new storm water regulations are. So that's across the bar board. We're doing it, everybody's doing it. Uh, we are in great position on that one. We have basically uh, a 95% set of drawings and we're just waiting for somebody to hand us a check. And we've heard rumors that the state will be paying that. They, they will, there will be money for that. Um, there is going to be money for that. We just don't know when it's going to arrive. But we're, we're going to be ready for this one with our hands out on that one. One of the interesting things about that project is that there is a 90, 110 rule on that one. What, this, what the state will say, is, what just they said is that they will pay 90%. How does it go? They will pay 90% of the project, and you pay 10% of the project. Or they'll pay 100% of the project if you pay 10% of that 100 towards an educational component. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So the project, when we last had it, we, thanks to Michelle Braun, years ago, that's why we're in such a good position. Michelle and friends of the Newski helped us get rolling on this four years ago. Yeah, a while, a long time ago. Yeah. Four years ago. Um, uh, so that, that, that piece is out there. Oh, oh so when we, when we estimated it back then, it was like $250,000. So it would be 25, 30, 35,000. Who knows where that's going to come. But that piece, so, and I think 
that though this stormwater is sat in a meeting with some consultants of the state that said last March said, if anybody wants to start working on it this summer, you go ahead. There's a lot of people saying, well, we don't generally have $400,000 just sitting waiting to spend on stormwater stuff. But I do think we want to be the first to do it, take advantage of it while the money's there, because I think it's who knows how long it's going to go. Um, those are the big ESSER and capital fund projects that you've heard about over the last, the last couple of years. Um, any questions? Uh, some of these other things that you've seen in here, you know, the roof summary, that's just something that we, we've been playing defense with COVID for so long. This is just a piece of information that I'm gonna collect over the, over the year just so we have it. We need to make sure that we're going. Green building activities, kind of separated this out a little bit. Again, RDS, we've got the heat pumps, between the heat pumps and the um, DDC control down there, I think we're gonna see, now it's a small building, but we're gonna see significant energy savings down there. I mean, it's just remarkable. Um, again, the new DDC control, it's all net metered down there. Uh, union, we're on district heat. We actually are meeting with our engineers next week and the city. There is, I won't confuse you with the way that we get charged for district heat, but sort of there's a capacity charge and then there's a usage charge. And there's a trick that if instead of just turning the valve 100% in the morning versus turning the valve very slowly over the course of an hour, we actually can save a significant portion of money doing that. Don't even... How in the world did we'll you figure that out? Yeah, we'll take your word for it. Don't even... Because I think it's what it is, is if everybody turns the valves at the same time, they have to build a building this... They have to build a plant this big to take that big slug. But if everybody turns it slowly, they can they could build essentially they, they don't need that capacity right on board because they can keep up with it as it generates up sure okay i think it's like it's i like, trust you That's well it's, I think maybe the analogy is if i could do it at home and you take a shower and wash the dishes and you know do something else all at once your hot water tank gets cold whereas if you turn this one take a shower and then do your dishes and then do something it it can keep up with it yep Sure, let's go with that. Let's go with that. <laughs> They've assured me that, that if we can do that, we can save some money over So Tara just has to hang out in the basement for an hour in the morning. So that we're working on. Uh, Main Street, really the big, the big piece that we had, are, again, unions and net meters, all the buildings, I'm gonna stop saying, all the meters are 85% of our power is, is generated in a solar field somewhere. It's only 85 <laughs> because that's all they are allowed to sell us because they can't guarantee 100%, so the powers that be don't sell us 100% because it's cloudy, they can't do it. So that's why that sort of capped at about 85%. Main Street, the biggest thing over at Main Street has been the good work that Mickey and Tom and uh, our controls and our HVAC people have been doing over there of just going through the system and again, that sort of, well, this room has always been hot, doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And this room has always been cold, doesn't exist anymore. Um, or, it won't be cold for much longer because we're fixing it. High school, um, again, lighting. Anytime we do lighting, that's kind of the big thing here. So as a district, we recycled 800 fluorescent bulbs this year. That wasn't just from this year, but we were tired of tripping over them and garbage cans full of them. So we boxed them all up and got rid of them. There was 800 of them. So it gives you a sense of how many LED strips we've put in this building just taking out bulbs. DDC control package, again, is gonna be huge. The Grunfoss pumps, uh, Tom went down there and those new pumps that we put in that are super efficient, it, unbelievable. Things are just, things that used to take an hour to warm up are now taking 20 minutes. And the pumps are drawing, you know, like it's a light bulb. It's amazing how, how good those pumps are. And again, they're so good that we don't even get, Efficiency Vermont doesn't need to give you a rebate on them. They're like, you're gonna, they're gonna pay for themselves in three years, so we don't need to give you a, uh, a, a rebate on that. As a thinking of Efficiency Vermont, uh, we have a weekly or a monthly meeting with them on projects that we're doing just to keep them in the loop. We're gonna, um, we also, just as anybody might wanna know, that fluorescent bulbs are gonna be illegal here another year or two. So rebates on LED fixtures are gonna go away. So if you're thinking about doing that sort of thing, 
You might want to do it sooner rather than later. Um, the district wide, we've got the facilities and um, building and facilities and energy. I, I apologize for not using the right term for what we are, but the facilities and energy committee. Uh, we've been meeting once a month and talking about different projects, uh, the track and energy things. We're, we're heading towards uh, really getting some closure, not closure, but really starting to define what, starting the process of defining what we want to be with regards to being green. Is it just a label? Is it a philosophy? Is it a what it is? So that, that's the big thing that's happening there. District-wise, uh, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Uh, driver's ed car is fully electric. Special, there's a special ed van that's, that's a hybrid. Um, and I don't see any reason why we would not continue that trend uh, with regards to as we, as we move forward with vehicles. That's the quick update. Uh, if there's any specific questions that anyone has, I'd be happy to do it. I do, uh, I said it last year, and it was a, it was a hunch. No, it wasn't a hunch. It, I knew how good Tara and Mickey would do in their positions, and they have absolutely proven it. And Tom has absolutely proven that making the hard decisions and waiting for the right people absolutely pays off. We have got an amazing crew right now, mm -hmm. all the way through. Absolutely amazing, um, and I don't I don't say that just to make people feel good. Um, we're still down a head custodian here at the high school, and we're still down a custodian, a float custodian, and those are positions we really need to we need, we need to fill. We've got a lot of people who've worked here a long time, and they've accrued a lot of hours, and we want them to take them. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you know, we we could easily say hire somebody just to cover vacations and, and time off. The crew, the other thing that's happened with regards to what Tom's master plan was when he got here was that it used to be very isolated and people wouldn't go from building to building. And now that they've all worked together and they've, they now are, everyone is happy to go help out somebody else because they know it's going to be reciprocated and they know they're going to go to a building that they can find the supplies that are exactly the same as the building they came from. Mm. And it's going to be set up exactly how. So going to another building and helping out is, is not an issue. And they, they absolutely do a fabulous job supporting each other. And I, I couldn't be happier with the way that's worked out. And if we ever fill those other two positions, it'll be... When? It'll be great. When? when we fill them. Right, right, right. right. Yes. Okay. I thought you were asking me a specific well, question. No, no. <laughs> we do uh, have those positions, right? It's just that we haven't filled them. Pardon? They are already allocated positions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're okay. just open. Just making sure. I just didn't know, um, earlier during public comment, Tracy had asked about air quality, and I didn't know if you could tell us, or Libby, what, what if anything, the district has in place in buildings that wasn't there sure. in 2019? And sure. So um, we have continued to, to have air filters available, and that's really, at this point, it is... It, it's sort of occupant determinant. If, they, if people want them, we have them, and we have, and we go through and change all the filters in spring, and it's really their choice. Um, You're talking about the standalone. The standalone HEPA filters. Yep. Okay. We have we have uh, continued with the maintenance and operations piece of it. You know, when there's something that's not working properly, we fix it immediately. There was a question or a comment about the the, the MERV 13 filters. Yeah. You know, those are, we, we talked back in, in COVID days about getting those. Unfortunately, the systems aren't designed to accommodate those. You know, they're just, it's trying, the, the systems are designed to push through a certain filter that wasn't, a MERV 13 is what maybe we designed for now or you put in a hospital, but it's not something that in 1980 when we were doing these, some of these buildings, it wasn't set up. So we would basically, it's, you know, we'd be putting something that was too restricted in our systems. Um, but we've also, again, we've had the box fans, we've got now the new control systems. We've also, one of the biggest things is the CO detection that was typically in a, high, in a school setting was like 1,200 parts per million. We've now lowered, we, during COVID, we lowered them as low as 600. Now, that sounds great until we get our heating bill because we're basically taking the air and pumping it outside. We are now in the process of unifying everything to 800 ppm. So 
that'll be the air will be fresher than it not quite as fresh as we had during COVID, but that was that's over that was overkill to, to a degree, uh, especially when it's negative 40 outside that blowing that out. So the 800 seems to be a sort of universal. Yeah, that sounds you know more than we would have a few years ago, but not just opening the windows in the middle of winter. So that's 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 probably the biggest change that we've got going here Thank for that. Hello. Um, I have a question about the roof uh, mm -hmm. here at the high school. So um, I just want you to clarify. Yep. The, the report says that the costs were too high to use the original uh, bond money to replace those parts of the roof, and that you put it, we put a membrane on it, right? Put to, a membrane coating on it. Okay. To sort of like st as a stopgap measure until we had the money to replace the roof. I don't think I'd refer to it as a stopgap. What it was was um, these membrane coatings, if you go out to St. John's Berry Academy, their, uh, their roof on their gym has these coatings, and they've become quite prevalent. And um, the one thing about them is they're as good as what's underneath them, and this roof was, was relatively old. So most of the time, it's not an issue. <coughs> Last year, we had a little bit of problem in the cafeteria. We actually have the roofers coming over <coughs> next week, this Sunday, to come and put some relief slits in it, open it up so it can kind of move a little more freely and, and put it over. Um, and, you know, we occasionally will get a leak a little, uh, we'll get a little leak. It's not like it's leaking all over the place. We go up, we silicone it, we're in good shape. And, and we've got a great contractor who put that on is very, very uh, um, responsive to our needs. It is different than a new roof. So to expect this silicone coating to last 25, 30 years, isn't realistic. 10, 15? I think for a roof like moving forward, so if you've got an EPDM dip roof, a rubber roof that has a expected life of about 25 years, 30 years now, if you take that roof like we have at Union and Main Street and put that coating on at year 15, then you can really, you know, then it pushes it. Again, it's all as good as what the substrate is. So it's not, I wouldn't say that it's a, you know, a looming, oh my gosh, you know, it's all kind of come crashing in on us by any stretch of the imagination. But it is, it is something that we need to be thinking about further down the road. Um, and same thing with Main Street, 40 years old, that one's a ballasted roof, so it doesn't get the UV, so it's really good. But again, it's 40 years old, so we gotta, we gotta put it on our radar. And in the capital plan uh, that's in the budget presentation, um, it says oh, that we- last year. Yeah, it says last year's budget yeah. presentation yeah. said that we put um, the fiscal year 23. Says that in fiscal year 19, we put $250,000 towards the uh, roof replacement of the main roof. So can, can you just clarify it? So the part that has the coating on it is the cafeteria and the in, in auditorium? As well. No, it's, it's, it's everything at the high school except the gym and locker rooms. Above this is a little bit different because we, we put the coating on, but it also was a ballasted roof. So we pulled all the stones out, put the coating on, put down a layer of insulation, then put the stones back on. So that one's probably gonna, it's gonna be even longer lasting because it's newer and it doesn't get the UV rating. It doesn't get the UV beating of the UV. So the $250,000 that was spent in 2019 was for this process of the- That was FY 2019. Um, yeah, I believe Grant might have done that. Not, not, not blaming Grant, but that might have been a carryover from the, the bond. But the bond wouldn't be here in this capital plan, right? Right, but I think that, that the difference might have been. Like if it wasn't enough to, to do that, we just made up that gap with the... Okay, because in, in my interpretation of the report, it was that we didn't have enough money to like do the full replacement of the roof, so we did this coating instead that I Correct. would have assumed would be cheaper than replacing the actual Absolutely. roof. Absolutely. So then I would think that whatever money was earmarked for the, the replacement of the roof in the bond would have been sufficient to pay for that, the coating, but maybe not. It may not, there, that 250 might have been a gap. And I have to, I'd have to look back at that. I'm, I, I'm, that was the year Andrew and I came in. Like they were doing the roof when Andrew and I started working here, yeah. so we just have to work. 
that's the year Andrew and I both came yeah. in. Like they were actually doing, doing the roof the on our day day one of work, so we'd have to look. Back. I'd have to get back. I'd have to go back and look okay. at look at my records on that one. Well, and one of my questions about that that I would be interested in knowing doesn't have to be now is just um, if we don't, as a school board, spend or a district spend the money that was appointed uh, for a project in a bond, what happens with if there is, you know, a difference in that spending? No, we would have we would have spent what what was asked for mm -hmm. to the public for a bond, we would have spent it on that. That doesn't mean that the, the public voted on a, roof, a roofing project. The original scope wasn't able, wasn't, we weren't able to do the exact scope that we thought we were gonna do, okay. but we did do a roof project and we did, and, it, and it, again, it's a, it's a quality piece. It's just okay. not a 40-year not a 40, 40 solution. Yeah. Thank, I think I'm all set with that. Um, I mean, in the report, it says that both the roof at the high school and at the middle school, those costs are TBD. Is there to be any, determined? I, I want to. Is there any like you know sense of how much it'll be? Or? Four years ago, I would have told you exactly what to budget for an EPD, which is basically rubber. It's petroleum, mm -hmm. and how much insulation, which is petroleum. Um, how much you could budget square foot? I think those numbers right now, you know, you, you forget you could. I think for some roofing projects, four months ago, if somebody said I want to do a roof, they would they'd say we can't even get the materials, so I can't even give you a price. So that's what I want to do. I just want to go through all those, take some core samples, really understand what we've got there, so we can understand the the project moving forward, any any potential projects moving forward. So yeah, I'll be I'll be working on that this year. That was one of my questions though, was sort of like ballpark figure. And I know it's really hard in this climate to give a ballpark figure, but, but like we obviously got an estimate for that roof in 2019 <laughs> or somewhere in there. Like what was it then? Uh, well, the problem was the estimate that we got then, I'm not getting too deep into the weeds, the problem, we, 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 the estimate we got there was a solution that wouldn't work here. Ah, okay. So it was, it was the whole concept of, peeling back the membrane and putting a new membrane on. That was not gonna work here. To actually do the roof here, we're gonna have to peel the roof and take the insulation, and then we can't mechanically adhere it. We have to, we have to glue it down, basically. So I wouldn't, I, I, at this point, I wouldn't be comfortable giving you that number because there's too many variables. That's why I need to really dig into it. Um. First of all, I want to appreciate you, Andrew, for just like, sometimes I self-internal is like, I'm, I'm too busy. And then I see this and I'm like, dear God, <laughs> how does he keep track of all this? And so, and not only that, but then like succinctly and clearly delivering it to us so that we constantly have something to reference, I just really appreciate. Um, and I also just want to echo that, you know, when the Facilities and Energy Committee did take tours of the buildings, the visits with um, Mickey and Tara were in fact, I would say memorable for me, like just so bright, so energized, um, which is not something you always see. <laughs> and um, so I just really do wanna appreciate them because I just felt really enthusiastic and energized and it was really notable. Um, and yeah, I wonder just kind of looking at like the future major projects upcoming, if there's any of them that, you know, kind of thinking about them from like an urgency perspective if any of them feel like more urgent than others and just if that puts things into kind of like a, a timing perspective and then you know that there are a number of them that have kind of the TBD funding source and I wonder if there's any things that we look at that have like a safety implication or an energy improvement implication if we can ever source like grants and incentives to kind of offset because kind of I did a little bit of totaling of like you know the the potential like TBD uh, like funding source items and it's quite a bit of money so just wondering where we have opportunities to like offset that and source other fund funding sources um. There's nothing in this that, I mean, the ones that I had a pretty good sense, I put the numbers down. There's, if there was a project that I, that I thought that had to be done today, it would be presented to you as it has to be to, done today. These, I wanted to pull out things that would not usually fall within the normal budget, the normal sort of course of events of what we do. Um, so I just wanted to put them out there so that we were thinking about it. But no, if there was something that was a, a health, safety, and welfare issue, it would be forefront and 
other projects would be bounced, bounced for it. Um, you know, things like, you know, things like the fire alarm panel at the at Main Street. It works. It works fine. It's doing its job. It's old. It's starting. Parts are becoming difficult to, to source. Um, so let's not forget about it and work it into a budget at some point. And I One think of Andrew's goals with this facilities report that I know he said a few times too is that when he wins the Powerball, because he's not <laughs> retiring or leaving me anytime soon, but when he wins the Powerball, that the person who steps into right. his role knows what the plans are and what the needs are. And I think that's a little bit of what you see there too. He had to do a lot of figuring things out when right. he took over, and so the next person who comes into Andrew's role won't have to do that. Yeah. Amanda? Well, I don't appreciate this forest. <laughs> I think it's great. I think it gave me a lot to look at. Um, I do have a question around that timeline. Like, we not do this right now. When is the roof going to start leaking more? When is the alarm? You know, like, is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it three years? If I knew the it's sound like a stockbroker, but if I knew those, I wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. You know, it's, again, the fire panel works fine at Main Street Middle, but when they come to service it or replace out ahead, they go, you know, you really, parts are getting scarce for these things, and, and you should put this on your radar, and that's all we're doing here is putting that on your radar. Again, the roofs, that roof at Main Street <clears throat> Middle School could go another 15 years, could go another 20 years. But let's, let's go through, let's do some core samples, let's... Yeah get some professionals up there and document it somewhere. So again, so when whoever takes my position can come in there and go, okay, now I know what the roof assembly is and if we go to replace it, I know I've got to do X, Y, and Z. So if it was imminent, I would, if it was, if I knew it was imminent, it would be in front of you as imminent. Thank you. And um, Roxbury, you were mentioning something about the what was it? The flooring con the which, which room is it? Sorry. Uh, the one that you have to go around if you are in a wheelchair, you have to go around. The town hall, the entrance to the town hall. Okay. Yeah. And then there's what what is the other issue in Roxbury around mud? <laughs> Uh, oh, it's just, it's the, it's the low spot. It, yeah. it's, 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 it's the flat spot in town. Um, and, and apparently, in talking with, who's the gentleman that, that showed us around? Uh, Mr. Twombly. Is that who it was? The full historical yeah. Yes. At one point, if I remember correctly, they used to drain it across the road to the river. And he said when they redid the railroad, or they, they redid something, they got rid of that. So at one point, there used to be, I don't know whether it was better or not, but, but it was different. There was houses down there before the playground got, so, got put in. So that's, that's always going to be a challenge down there. It's just the low spot. Luckily, it, it, um, it does per, pretty well. So there's usually a couple weeks in the spring that, it's, that there's a little lake down there, but it, goes, it eventually goes away and it dries out fine for the, for the summer. And the stuff in front of the door, um, Beth, and the principals as well have also, now that they've been working with Tara and Mickey and Tom for so long, they know and the teachers know that when there's a problem, it gets resolved. Now, it kind of created an <laughs> a wave there for a little while. Of, well, we're getting stuff done. <laughs> People get throwing things on. But Beth has done a great job. Tara has a, uh, um, Tara has a great relationship with the kids down there. So the teachers are doing an amazing job as well in helping uh, the custodial crew go back through. They, they kind of collected and there's some faces in this room that were over at Union last winter and um, you know, Tara came into a meeting and said, oh, this, is, this is kind of the stuff we picked up off the floor. And I, Tom and I looked at it and so like, that would be one day. <laughs> Forget three weeks. The first three weeks. Well, that would, you know, a year ago that was one day's worth of stuff. So they're doing, they're doing great on that. And, um, and Beth and Julie and Katie really are on board with that. And we've also, another thing that um, that we've done in the buildings is, and I think anyone who's been in them, we luckily, now that code is sort of quieted down, we've been able to take tables out of the hallways. We've taken all, again, that sort of clutter that just became kind of the, what it was.
Katie and Julie have been and have been working with custodians, and it's a totally different vibe. It's a total. And if anybody has been over in Main Street Middle or hasn't been in a while, it is just like you walk into it, and it's just I hate to say calming place, but compared to what it was five years ago, it absolutely. I mean, it, it has a different vibe. And same thing with Main. Same thing with Union. So. So Roosevelt in the issue of the track, I know last time we discussed it, um, it was mixed up with a discussion about the turf field. I think we've gotten a lot of feedback on the turf field, and it looks like it's a complex issue that may, may take some time. And I also know that you know many people spoke eloquently about wanting to get a track project moving. Um, again, could you remind us of the timeline if we were to do that, kind of the budget process? When would you need kind of we signal need, from the board? I know there's some we're, we're at a, we want to kick we're it. at a, in talking with our engineers, and it's really permitting and, and that process that's our biggest uh, is probably going to be the slowest down as much as anything. Um, we're at that. If we had any hope of starting a breaking ground next summer, um, we're at that. We got to make a decision. We, we're at a go, no go. Um, that still doesn't guarantee that we would actually be able to break down next year, but if we wait m much longer, it's almost a guarantee we wouldn't be able to break down next summer. And just to have an understanding of the numbers, my understanding is there's kind of two numbers out there. One is 1.8 million should be doing kind of the track alone minus the facilities building, which would give us about a 300,000 delta from what we committed. Um, and then there's the bigger project, which has the facilities building, which would be about $2.4 million, which would be more like a $900,000 delta, which sounds like a bigger deal. In times of like, you know, we've committed $1.5 million. Um, you've not gotten a, gotten a signal from the board about the other $300,000 to $900,000. Um, in terms of board action to make you feel comfortable moving at the timeline you need, my feeling is you'd probably need some sort of signal from the board that if you put that three hundred thousand dollars in the budget, we would support it in January. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We would, um, with regards to the facilities, we would still need to yeah. build a, a storage area at some for, for the mats. I think that this is this is actually the timing of this works out well in that we've got so many ESSER projects already going. Yeah. It's not like we would, if we took the sort of local funding that we would usually spread around the schools and created that extra facility for Tom or Matt, however it works out. Um, now, it, it definitely would not be the facility that was proposed, but it would certainly be as good as what we have now. And it would be closer to the, the building, so actually it could function pretty well. It would, it would function well for what we have and be better than we, what we have now. And again, as a time when actually just letting those big projects happen, we'd have great improvements in those other buildings um, if we took it so out the, of those. Does the board understand what Andrew said and spread, the normal spreading around for the buildings? Do you know what I mean? He no, that was going to be a clarifying question. <laughs> yes. So we, we usually spend, as a, as a, just a way to think about it, we usually spend about $125,000 a year in each building. And that is Obviously, when it comes to Roxbury, it shifts a little bit, but think of it that way. And that money is allocated towards projects that we do, renovating classrooms, putting a new carpet in here, redoing the lights, and... General upkeep. And, and yeah. general okay. upkeep that the pipe breaks at the Union mm -hmm. Elementary School and we need to go. So that, that number is usually around 120, it's usually around 500,000. It was less last year. Um, <clears throat> But that was okay because we knew we were going to do a little less because of the new head custodians. So, again, at Main Street, if we're doing the cafeteria and the kitchen and the playground, and at Union we're doing all those other projects, it's not as if using ESSER funds. Using ESSER funds. Right. If we instead of putting that spreading that more equally around the district, we actually took a bigger chunk and said let's let's build that garage um, at the high school that would support the needs of the track. We wouldn't, it's not as if we'd walk in next September and go, we didn't do any here thing this summer. We'd actually walk into Union and go, we did the auditorium, we did the little gym, we did all these other projects. So the timing actually works pretty well with regards to sort of overloading one building for, than, than sort of more evenly spreading things out, which we typically do in a given year. Yeah. 
And, I, and I'm going to dip my hand here and then ask a question. Uh, yeah. My sense is that what we're hearing is we don't have any urgent other pressing needs that are going to demand a large amount of money. We're in a situation that I think we're kind of constantly at where we have, you know, with old buildings, things that potentially could go wrong, things that we're keeping an eye on, et cetera. That situation is probably unlikely going to be much different in a year or two years or three years. Uh, we've already had, this is the 18th time the board has talked about the track. Uh, we've had, I think, unprecedented public comment. We've looked at the minutes, 18th time. <laughs> it has come up in meetings. Uh, we've had unprecedented public comment, um, almost universally in support. Um, and, and we have a great program out there on the track that, Nathan, as a, as a coach, would you agree that it is marginally safe and can only can only be prepared for competition with an extensive effort by volunteers the day before um, do you think there is wisdom in waiting to move forward assuming that that two to three hundred thousand dollars delta can be responsibly closed um, I would say that that is that's a it's a big question to ask me. Uh, I think if that's what the school board wants to do, I think that's. Um, uh, does it does it give you heartburn or make you feel that? No. Oh, yeah. oh you're saying no. Yeah. No. If if I thought that, that needed to be there, I would let you know that there is something. Again, yeah. I may, may sit here nine months from now with egg in my face, but at what we know today, no. I wanted to just quickly throw in as a member of the facilities and energy committee. I think that's what we are. I like I, I kind of wrote out our timeline because I feel like the last meeting we had like a lot of different ideas floating around. But um, we at our we had a meeting this summer in August where we had sort of a track kickoff, and then we've had subsequent meetings where we met with the engineer. And I think you folks saw some of those <coughs> at a more recent meeting. There, the, the option that the Facilities and Energy Committee and Andrew sort of recommended to move forward on, on what was recommended here is really the most modest possible track solution. So I want to be really clear to like fellow board members and the public, like there, there, it was like a game of Jenga trying to like, well, what if we put the track angled this way? Well, then we lose baseball. I mean, there really were like no other options. And even I think one of the original hopes was to have eight lanes all the way around. I've learned a lot about track lately, but we're able to do the six lane with the eight lanes straight away. Like it's literally this is as modest a project as it physically could be to get what the program needs. Um, it's the least disruptive. It's the least expensive. It keeps it in the same location, um, but does provide that sort of eight lane straight away, which sounded like it was still worthwhile. And my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, there is the building that's sort of on that backside of the bleachers, but it won't be accessible the way that it could be now. And so, and between that and it needing a, to be a storage place for the other items is why it was raised to us. But it certainly doesn't preclude the isolated track itself project. So I just wanted the public to know this isn't some glamorous over the top track. This is very modest as small a footprint as, as, as could be done. That's all. From the September 21st finance committee meeting, there was sort of a, it turned out that $400,000 had been budgeted to be utilized that wasn't utilized. And so that kind of covers the Delta $300,000 from so really, we were well over our 2% goal for a rainy day fund, essentially. We had an unexpected $400,000 set of funds, mostly related to the influx of federal dollars and sort of just a lot of stuff that didn't happen the way it normally happens. But I just want to put that out there, that that also was is part of our financial situation at the moment was an extra four hundred thousand dollars, essentially that we we I'm sure we could find use for, but it, it had it had we thought we were going to use it and we didn't use it. And once the audit goes through, it gets put in the fund balance, so it gets added to the fund balance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when is the audit? Maybe? The audit's already complete. We're just waiting for them to write the report for us. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Eva. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've just really appreciated the level of public input that we've received over the past year, mostly, um, on the track project. And, you know, I'm always especially appreciative of students, so for all of your students who came um, over the past year. And I looked back at um, the original presentation that was done by Meg and Ezra and Ben um, was in April, uh, over a year ago, right? April of 2021. Um, and that, that to me feels like the sort of starting point of my of, of the track really being on my radar as a board member was when they gave that student presentation. Um, but I've really appreciated the robust public input that we've received over the past year. And even <laughs> after the last meeting, um, I did feel like the Times Argus article was misrepresenting what was discussed at our last meeting. But even that misrepresentation sort of like spurred another uh, public dialogue that, that helped me as a board member sort of understand where my community is at on all of this. And I do feel like there's overwhelming support for the track and it feels like there's money, but then there's, there's some questions that I still have. So kind of to the question that Jim, you posed in the beginning in your public comment um, about what it would take to really feel comfortable and confident is um, looking at the numbers and understanding that everybody, you know, that are the people who are really more in the know, like Libby and Andrew and Kristen, you know, feel really comfortable with that expenditure. Um, when I look at the facilities report, it feels like there's a lot being recommended, you know, over the next five years. Um, and then when I look at the capital plan over the next five years, it looks like really for that budget, we only have space for window replacement budgeted. Um, those are the only two lines that are filled out for fiscal year 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. So I know there's other money in the budget to help with some of those projects that were listed in the facilities report, but those are the things that I just want to make sure that we're being responsible about, that we're not spending all of our savings on this when it looks like in five years we might need a new roof or, you know, whatever it is that the auditorium, finishing the auditorium project or whatever it is. Um, so trying to wrap my brain around, you know, feeling really comfortable that this is like the most fiscally responsible and, and that the timing is right. And so that's where all of my questions are coming from. Yeah, I am so appreciative of all the public comment, of all the emails, of all the phone calls. I really, really... I love this community input. Um, I, I, to answer Jim's question, I kind of echo Mia. I would like to see kind of like a, a plan of like, what are we looking at in terms of like the next five years around some of these recommendations around like how it fits into the capital plan. I just, I feel like my perception of the financial asset board member has been like year to year, but I haven't seen like a, an, a goal, like a plan of where we like know exactly. And, and you know, things change, I, I, I get it. But to have a little better grasp on all these decisions that we're making, um, this report for me has been remarkable and to be able to see the big picture of all the pieces moving forward. So for me, it just feels like I want us to have like a plan that people understand too. Um, so one of the things I did get from the pushback around the turf, because like everybody was very supportive about the track, but the turf was a different, different animal. Um, it was that there are different pieces. What we're hearing from is from like the athletic folks, right? And what I got from the last time that this board engaged with community organizing, which was with the SRO, is that we wanted to hear from multiple perspectives. And that we created a system and a process. When we had our last retreat, we had both processes in place. One was like, this is how we made this decision, this is how we made the decision. And there was some challenges around like, how we made the track decision and how fast it was. So I would love to see, to, for me to feel good about this, I would like to see, for us to commit to make a plan on like to be able to 
take your recommendations and say, let's look at and figure out where that money come is. There's the two concerns that I have is that is coming down the pipeline, is the unknowns around the pupil waiting study. We keep talking about like how this might affect all of this stuff. And then the PCB testing, we know it's 2024, but that might have big implications. I'm gonna say that like, I don't wanna touch the 1.5 million that we already committed. I want to be able to get there looking at the big picture. So I think for me, it's like, can we create a process that is fair that we say to the, to the community members, hey, in three weeks, we're going to decide on this track. We're going to decide on this money. And it's everywhere. As someone who doesn't use social media, that's not where I learn about things. Uh, so like, what are the other avenues that people kind of can see and be part of the process, which is a lot of the conversations we've had this year. It's like, how do we involve community? How do we get their, their point of view? So I love the organizing piece. I love all the work that was done. I love the community input. I appreciate it. I want the track too, but I also want to be financially responsible as a board member. I want to feel like I'm making a decision with knowledge and with the proper practices. So. Um, yeah, um, I don't want to repeat a whole lot of what's been said to keep all of us here any later than um, we need to be. Um, but I do want to echo a deep appreciation and um, excitement about all of the input that we've gotten from the community and just state unequivocally that I would like to see the track improved as well. I really want it to happen. And we learned about these costs at the board meeting two weeks ago. And we, two weeks ago, we were like, oh yeah, sure, we think maybe it's in fund balance. And then Jim, tonight you said, well, we probably could work it into the general ed fund, the 300,000, and then the 500,000 for the shed could maybe come from money that we usually allocate for um, general maintenance. These are all really good ideas. But I think we can't just say, yeah, sure, let's do it, and then kind of actually put the, put the math together. I think we need to see the math first and then, and then decide. And, and, then he, and then have the public see the math and help us decide. And to me, the math, the, like what it would take is some other you know numbers that are more real than just things we've just said verbally in board meetings. Um, and, to, and I would also like to have a conversation about what other funding sources there could be. I recall that during, that what, after we received the presentation from the students in April of 2021, one of the things that I tossed out there as part of the conversation that night was, could we see some sort of private fundraising happen to help with the cost for this. In the 18 times this has come up, I believe you, fine, <laughs> in board meetings, we've never addressed that question. And it's okay if the answer is no, but if we're truly going to say that this is a conversation that's been happening for a year and a half, then we should say, okay, we've, we've vetted, we've truly vetted the idea, especially for something that is this, con a considerable amount of money like this. So that, to me, is what it would take for me to be able to say either, great, let's put an extra $300,000 in the gen ed fund and use general maintenance for this one-time expense. Maybe that's the best idea out there. But maybe a better idea is use some of our funding fund balance and run a huge fundraising drive with all the enthusiasm <laughs> of all the people who have emailed us and showed up at meetings. That's a, that's a massive effort. And I bet that kind of energy could put, be put behind a you know, great fundraising drive. I think we need to be able to have a comprehensive conversation, not just random ad hoc conversations over the course of a long period of time, for us to truly be able to say, yes, we have made the most financially responsible decision that is also an awesome decision for our student athletes for now and in the future. Sergio? Um. Yeah, I feel like, from my point of view, the problem here is was scope creep. That we had 1.5 set aside for the track that was approved. At the time, Grant said, you know, finding the 300 grand isn't a problem between different funds. 
And then we were at that point, but then all of a sudden it's like, well, what about a new shed? What about turf? What about this? What about that? And so I, I don't want that to get in the way of us replacing the track in general. Like Andrew said earlier, we need to make a decision now. So I feel like we should go back, if it's feasible, approve the 1.5 slash 1.8 for the track and then address the other issues as they, as they come. I don't know if that's a, a realistic way to approach it now. That, that but. is feasible through the budgeting process, right? One of the challenges is the budgeting process. You all haven't seen a budget presentation yet because we're working on putting that together for you, right? <laughs> right now. So, so should we go ahead with the track? You would see that, right? We'd, we'd have the report from the auditor as re re referenced earlier. That money, the, ex the money that wasn't used last year would be in the fund balance. So we could commit that. You'd see that in the budget, right? And then you'd also see, the board typically sees room renovation and general, as Mia so nicely put it, as general maintenance. That's usually under Andrew's facility tab. And in the budget presentation, you would see as something different than it typically is. Yeah. And what the person who is most knowledgeable about this information is telling the board tonight is that we probably don't have the capacity to do gen the general maintenance of the room cleanup of picking and, up and let me, carpets. Let me clear, it's not maintenance. We would not tap into that. We would not. Oh, it's not like the daily maintenance. It's not the it's daily the maintenance. It's, it's, the, it's the summer projects, the classroom renovations. It's not the, it's not the maintenance. It's the sort of. Because of Grant, Grant, would be, Grant would be proud of me. It's the 2620 projects, not the 2621 projects. <laughs> um, it, again, it's the it's That's the summer in, it's the summer improvements, <laughs> not the maintenance. We would yeah, never we would never our, skimp on the maintenance. Our staff would not have the capacity to do that because they'd be working with the contractors to be renovating the small gym and the auditorium and the you know and the and the that we have planned to do this summer. Um, so that's not a loss. That's just using those funds differently. And so you'd see that in the budgeting process. Can we do that any faster than what we're doing right now? No, no. we can't because it's not the budget. It's not you know no. the budget right. season right now. Yeah. And let's also be kind of realistic about what we can and can't do. I mean, I think there's a there's an impetus, there's a I, I definitely hear what Amanda and Mira are saying, but there's also like letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. It would be great if we could organize a private fundraising drive, but who has time to do that, and who has time to even look into it in the next six to eight months? It would be, and then when we do come together to talk about it, we get ideas like let's do a turf field, and that sets us back six to eight months because then we have to look at a turf field. And then we come back and it's like, okay, well, what are we gonna look at next? We have a really golden opportunity to do something for our kids here. We have most of the money accounted for. Believe me, that's really rare. I've been on this board for seven years. That was not even close to the case with the elementary playground. We, we had to scramble to find money. The board spent far less time on that issue than it spent on this issue. We're a volunteer board. We have limited capacity. We have our administrators telling us that this is both an opportunity we have and it's an opportunity that doesn't give them heartburn and they're the ones that spend the most time with the money. We can do something for our kids. We can get some of those, those middle school kids that came tonight that have written us. We can get them a track for their junior, senior, sophomore year that they can run on. If we sit here and we keep talking about it and we sit here and we keep asking for more studies and we sit here and we keep talking about a perfect process and time to spend hours and hours on this, we will never build this track. The $1.5 million will get sucked up in another way and we will not have a track. I don't or agree. it'll be three or four years. I don't agree. How Jim. much more do we I need to talk agree. about it? We've been talking I about just it for gave you what I need. I just, if you want a vote, a yes vote from me, I just told you what I need. And I don't think it is fair to say that somebody is asking for a perfect process when what we are saying is we need to see some, at, like how this fits into a puzzle piece, like a giant puzzle of the complexities of funding the education in our district with enough time for us to sit with those numbers and think about it and make sure the public has seen them and given a chance to weigh in on, right now what we have heard overwhelmingly, I admit, and amazingly, has been the advocacy of the track. And that has all been through the lens of people who want the track. Of course, yeah. and of course, and you know, to their, they also understand there's a lot more to yeah. this district than the track. I'm not trying to belittle that at all. And as board members, it is, our job to hear all of that as a data point, a very significant one in this conversation, certainly, but a data point. And to, use, and, and to put that data point together with all the other ones. And 
This, another significant one is the fabulous facilities report that we have now seen for a year and a half. Yep. And that, and another data point is literally how do all the numbers line up? And I just don't, I, I really ha haven't seen it, you know? And it feels very, it feels financially tenuous to me to use simply just like words that have said been said verbally in board meetings over the course of what I'm talking about right now is just these last two board meetings where last board meeting we were like, oh, maybe we could pull in a little from fund balance. Oh, no, maybe actually what we're talking about is going to bond. And now we're saying, oh, maybe we could add a little to gen fund and maybe we could use some of the cl classroom and building renovation money. I mean, like I just said, I think these are all really great ideas, but we have to make sure that it all adds up. And I'm not talking about a one-year process. I'm not even talking about an eight-month process. I'm just talking about we got to be able to see how it all adds up, give the public a chance to see it, and weigh in on it, and then decide. Did Brett have his hand up? Yeah. No, I've seen both Brett and Joel. Um, Brett? I have concerns about the maintenance building idea. Yeah. And the hearing now is unnecessary. It's essentially, not that there isn't a need for a maintenance building, but there's a possibility to meet the needs, to meet sort of the minimum needs, without dipping, without adding to the 1.8 that is going to be the cost of the track surface. Um, also, hearing from community members from Roxbury who are finding this as a way of community building and friend making and you know, having an opportunity to hang out after school and make friends and be and, and in ways that they otherwise wouldn't be able to, hugely beneficial to me. I'm definitely, I'm very, you know, two things like, anal you know, analysis paralysis is a great phrase. And, you know, we don't need unanimity on this board to vote this forward. We just need a majority, however that works. So I, I would prefer to have a vote, if not, I mean, I would prefer to have a vote tonight, honestly. That's what I would like, because I think that the money's there. I mean, $400,000 sort of appeared, and that makes up the difference from 1.5 to 1.8. That's, I, I mean, I'm not a financial, you know, wizard, but I listen to people that know more about finances. And I'd like to make a little bit of clarity, if I can, just your phrase of the scope creep. I would say that the the scope creep, the only thing that was really a scope creep, we, we did those full exercise so that when we sat in these meetings and we were ready to make a decision, someone didn't stand up in the back and go, did you think about a turf field? So that's why we kind of did that. So that scope creep was more just preemptive. With regards to the maintenance building, the original vision of this, or part of this, was was a, a building that was attached, it was heated, it was a, it was, you know, it was a true full maintenance 10, building. We would not be able to build that 500, we're not gonna pull $500,000 out of the maintenance, the, the improvements of the building. What we now, what I've now looked at this and said, can we replace what we have <coughs> out there? You know, maybe we throw a gas heater in it so that in the shoulder season, we can go out there and change the oil and clean up the mowing equipment, but it wouldn't be nearly the facility that was originally envisioned. So that, that was, that was really the only sort of scope creep, and that was just on mine because it was, that was where I had the input of what would be, in talking with Tom, what would be a beneficial building. If we, have, if we were gonna do this, what would be beneficial to our equipment and all that. Now, the, in looking at if there's a f smaller bucket to pick from, can we replace what we've got out there now, basically the same location, move it up to next to the school, but not connect it, not make it out of brick, not make it, you know, not a floor drains and things like that, but a facility that's, they can get in there and work and, and, and maintain their vehicles. That is a much smaller scope. That building is now, I estimated, estimated in the last couple of days, if we had $100,000 to build that, you know, would it be great to have the $600,000 building and, and heat and all that? Absolutely. But to get a facility that is as good as, it does not make our track, our um, maintenance, in worse shape than it is now with regards to storage and place for mowers and things like that. That's where that 100,000 would come from from those improvements. So that that's- also, 
protect the actual equipment? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a garage. It's an unheated uh, garage. Not, went, just the, not just the mowers and the tractors, but the, the actual track equipment? Track equipment would Separate. stay down in the existing building that we have. Okay, right. right. Yeah, yeah. Because we can't, we can't access it once we build that track. Jill? Yeah, I, um, I did a little bit of preparing for tonight just to make sure, because I've sort of lost track of the timeline, and I readily admit that I participated in the scope creep. Um, it seemed like a reasonable sort of if you're going to dig up your foundation, why not also you know redo the floor in your basement? But um, I and I do think it 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 we got some pretty major sticker shock about the multiple options last week that kind of threw us off track. But I just want to remind everyone, and I hope it I hope it gives some of us some peace of mind. You know, we had the presentation from the students in spring of 2021. It was very compelling. In October 21 2021, we had a meeting with our administration and the board where we discussed at length various funding streams and the concern at the time that our business manager made about if we continue to have this large fund balance that it actually puts us in a vulnerable position. So we have, you know, so then we had sort of like, we have the problem of needing the track replaced and we have the problem of we really can't continue to just carry this massive fund balance because it's at risk of being swept by the AOE and we knew that there were other education funding pieces coming into place. So it was like two problems with the same solution. So in April 2022, we as a board voted to allocate the 1.5 million to the track from the fund balance and also um, I think it was 50,000 for the net zero study which the RFP is underway thanks to Kristen right now. And then in August we had the sort of track kickoff with the vendor and then in September um, we asked for the specific estimate for um, you know, the, the sort of levels, right? So the track, the drainage, and then we did ask for um, what adding the turf would cost. And even at that time, the vendor said that would probably double the cost. We didn't ask or really talk about the press box concession or lighting. Those weren't pieces that, that came up at that meeting. And like I said, you know, we went with the, we didn't even ask them to sort of price out at length the bigger, more grandiose ideas. It was like, okay, so the least expensive, least disruptive track, we absolutely already committed to that project. And so I think we knew even at that time in April 2022, when we voted to allocate the 1.5, that there was a good chance it wasn't gonna quite cover it. And can I just add something? At, at around that time, or even before, we got a, about a $2 million estimate for the track, and the current number is 1.8. So these are not, that is not an old number. So I feel reassured if I just sort of set aside the other possibilities, because we do have, we do need more time on those then really what we're talking about tonight is, is if we are comfortable asking for the administration to come back in our budget planning for the 271000 that we didn't have fund balance. And that makes it a little bit more of a narrow conversation. And then we can definitely continue to have conversations about the pieces that we have in here and lighting. I made some comment about the lighting and the, and, and the Times Argus photographer's like, no, you really actually do need to fix your lighting at some point. So there, we can have the time and the space to talk about those bigger projects but for the like one immediate piece, it's actually a much smaller decision that we're we're under pressure to make, and we frankly already made that decision in April. That's all. With, with the knowledge that 1.5 million was probably going to be a little short, right? So we're probably in the 500,000 dollar range, and it turns out that we can do it probably in the 300,000 dollar range. So that again, that's not a new number. Amanda. So now I'm going to tell my perspective and my timeline um, when that. The reason why we have all these money is because as our funding too, all that influx of money was able to allow for a lot of flexibility of things. This was, I remember talking to Beth when the ESSER funding question was, did ask like, how do we spend? Let's get a truck, let's get a baseball field, let's get, you know, all these other things. So I, I think that we just like have to, the reason why this amount is unprecedented is because there's all, there was also other, other influx of money that came in during our COVID times. Um, so I think for me, when I made that $1.5 million decision last time was because it was the pressure to put money so that we had it good in the audit. It wasn't because I felt that this process was great. Um, I felt that it was rush in terms of community input. That is what I bring to this board every time. It's like, I wanna have more conversations. Let's have it, you know, listening session. If only two people 
can see the numbers, like I, I think like that's the way that we can like that has been a challenge for this board to like be able to get feedback, right? Like so I think for me I voted on the pressure that we could have this process better now. And so for me to hear that I need to make a decision today or next week without being able to get the numbers and be able to get the feedback from the people, that's where I think it's the process. I'm not a volunteer board member, I'm an elected board member. And my responsibility, I feel, as an elected board member, is to ha make decisions that are, for me, financially sounding, that I could see the whole picture. And right now, I'm not seeing the whole picture. And so that's what I'm asking. I cannot vote yes if there is a vote today, unless there is a process that kind of aligns with right numbers and with a little more input from the community. And if people don't write back, but if we can say, there will be this meeting, please come. This was not in any of the places that, you know, like, again, I'm not on social media, so if anybody else wrote it anywhere else, this was not a conversation that other people knew. So that was going to happen today. And we know that half the people are not looking at the MRPS website to see what the school board member is up to, unless they're in the know. Jim Merrick had had this on the Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I agree with Jim and Brett and um, Jill. I think that um, we've had a pretty extensive process already. Like, it's been a year and a half. And even if that process hasn't been perfect, I mean, I don't think there is a perfect process, and I feel like no, like I just feel like we're gonna continue. Like it could just keep going on forever. I feel like I think there is a time to just go forward it with it or not. And I agree with what Jill said. We already did agree to go forward with it back when we voted for the 1.5 anyway. So I say just, I mean, forget the press box and forget the whatever else that those add-ons let's just go back to that original that original track in itself and from what Rhett said in the finance report it sounds like the money's there in the capital report or will be to fund the track on its own so i think this is feasible um <clears throat> i want to ask a process question <laughs> about tonight um so one of the things that i have an issue with i mean it sounds like what you were proposing, Jim, was just sort of a discussion that would signal. Yeah, I think, I think all we need process-wise is a comfort level that if Andrew starts making calls on November 1st to get the track process moving and Andrew and Libby work to the you know, work the budget, that there's support on the board that when it comes to a vote in January, it's going to be a yes, and Andrew's not going to have to make a bunch of calls and, and pull back a bunch of spent money. So that actually is not a vote of it's, us tonight. It's kind of like a will of the board to, it's, it's, yeah, we do not have to, I think, formally vote. Because one thing that I struggle with is uh, that I struggled with last time <laughs> the track issue was on the agenda for a possible vote, which it sounds like this isn't really, is just that it wasn't on the agenda yeah. for tonight. So that's like a frustrating thing that I battle with, with like, if we're going to make, even if it's just, it sounds to me like this is a $300,000 decision, not a $1.8 million decision. Yeah. So if it's a $300,000 decision, that feels a lot more comfortable to me. I'm getting the sort of signals from the admin team that I would want to know that it feels fiscally responsible to them. But, um, but, but like voting on it tonight feels we don't, we don't have to vote. Wrong, because it's not on the agenda. So I would, I, I mean, I wonder if this conversation is, so the other process question is, is a signal enough, like if we're putting it, because to me it feels like there's enough money in the fund balance, which, which is, you know, and not to have to put it into the budget. And I feel like that would probably feel more comfortable to voters as well. Um, but so if we do that or if we put it or if the will of the board is to put it in the in the budget um 
you know, is just the signal enough for you to like move forward and break ground in 2023? Just <laughs> or, as a point of clarity, though. I'm yeah. Gonna, you'd see, in the budget presentation, you would see what we use that amount of fund balance yeah. for. It would be part of the budget presentation. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, so you weren't talking about putting it in the general yeah. fund. You were talking like about it would be in process. the budget presentation. Yeah, in yeah, the budget presentation. That would be publicly discussed, yes. and we would have many months. You would many yeah. months. You would always see two. You would see what we choose yeah. to use the fund balance on, right? The, right? It's the board's prerogative what we use the fund balance on. So I see. So I you, you were that would be that wouldn't be void of the budget process. Like you would see it. What I don't want to have happen is for us to say, well, they've already uncovered the 1.5 million. We need 300 thousand more. So we're going to pull that from the fund balance. And the first time you see that, and yeah, you're okay, I see what you're saying. And you say, yeah, why I thought you were talking yeah, about exactly. putting it into some other place yeah. in the budget, in yeah. the general fund budget, and not no. pulling yeah. it. From, I see. No, well, that's but you still of see it in the budget presentation. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I guess I'm just feeling like it's uncomfortable for me to like sort of make that signal or vote when it's not on the agenda for an item of discussion. Um, and I'm wondering if we push it to the next meeting. I, I think we can push it to the next meeting. If that's enough but time. I, I think the next meeting is, my guess is the next meeting is November. So the next meeting is probably as late as you would want us to go. Well, I, it's, it is, you know, they're, they're not sitting at their offices waiting for our phone call. They got plenty of work going on. It's as much planning and saying, okay, this is a critical path item, so we got to get on it. You know, we, let's get let's get this meeting set up. Let's get this. And we've already, like I say, we've done some soil testing and all that. So, again, they're not sitting there waiting for us. But this, if we gave them a we're, we're a ninety percent, if I could pick up the phone tomorrow and say we got a ninety percent that we're going to get the full support and a and a and a full commitment, get ready. They would start getting ready, and they would be thinking about okay, so we got to move this person to the project, and we got to you know they're looking at their staffing as they go forward, and as well as the permitting stuff. So um, that you know that 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 would probably be enough for them at least to start planning. Now we don't also don't want to get two months into the process and yank the rug out from under them because they've planned for us and they've planned this process, but it doesn't sound like that's well. Any time having. you're working, sorry. You go ahead. <clears throat> so um, I think coming back to, I think it was Jim's question, which I thought was a great one, helping us to frame this discussion about what do we need. And I think, um, I think where I just need some support is thinking about, you know, and I found this section of the report tonight, the major upcoming and potential projects is really, really helpful. Um, and so I don't want you to feel like we're punishing you for giving us like this incredible like transparency and like this is what I think and you know it's really an act of mercy for whomever might come in after you that they have this thread that they can follow. But I think what, what I'm just thinking about is like again there's just you know a lot of projects that we know at some point they're going to happen and then there's a lot of TVDs. So my question is, is like if we all of a sudden have to replace like a fire alarm panel like tomorrow or there's a roof that's leaking tomorrow, you know, where do we go to access funds like pretty immediately? Is that where we go Remember to that 2% that, revert? Yeah, that's okay. why you have the, the okay. policy that has a certain amount. You're not depleting your entire fund balance. Right. Right? You have a policy that maintains a certain yes. level. Yeah. And so that's where we go for that kind of stuff. So I think for me, like hearing that, that that's where we were, that's where that rainy day fund is. That's why it's there. That's how we could deal with like any sort of acute emergency urgent project we could go there. That gives me comfort in, in starting and to move ahead. And yes, I'm, I, I agree that kicking it to the next meeting to make this kind of, for this opportunity, for this, this official signaling, you know, as it's being called, um, I would feel comfortable with that. But just highlighting that that's what that leftover 2% <laughs> is for, is this, like the bottom drops out and we need money tomorrow, that's where it comes from, is comforting for me. And if I can just very quickly build off of what Kristen said, for me, for me, hearing that is helpful and then actually seeing it, it like it it would be helpful to have Christina here to be able to ask mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. kinds of questions of before making a decision like this. So before I go to one, I just so it sounds like we'll we'll pick this up again at the second, but I'm hearing most members feeling comfortable that they can be brought to a good place to vote yes on a budget that includes from either the fund balance or another source, the delta needed to make this track happening. So Andrew can start to maybe feel a little more comfortable about asking some people to get ready to move. Is that what I'm hearing? Am I, 
with the idea that we'd be able to ask some of those questions that, that me and Amanda want over the next two to three months. And if we get surprising answers, we can, we can deal with those. But is that I'm largely what probably. I'm hearing? Huh? I'm strong, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what I also think, like, this is the nature of the beast of contractors working for school districts that are relying on voter-approved funds to do their projects. It's like you're going to have to line somebody up, and then everything could fall apart. Mm. Let's hope not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, don't, I, I don't want to get there. That's why I would yeah. like to make sure we have actually looked at the math. That's like I really don't want to get there. Right. No, I know, but I mean, but I'm just saying hypothetically, like if a vote, if a if a budget isn't approved, it's like you have to defer projects sometimes. And I mean, that's just sort of like the nature of school districts, publicly funded projects. It's like, I think we have $1.5 million committed to this already. That's almost 90% already, you know? It's a, it's a little bit different in that most, when you have a project, if you, if you you've got me, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, in most projects, uh, an architect or an engineer, it's a lost leader. You lose money working with schools, bringing them to, to bond. They're, they're doing it that they hope that you pass the bond and then they get the contract to do the big work. Mm -hmm. They're not, our, our engineers are not in that position. They're not, they're, they're gonna charge us their $150, $200 an hour to do work. Um, if this was a different, if this was a bond vote kind of thing, absolutely, we'd get it much cheaper because they would be assuming that, okay, there's a $5 million project, a $10 million project at the end of their work. So um, very rarely do you go all the way up to the to, to town meeting day to decide whether you actually can fund the project. And you certainly don't do that with, con with the actual construction people because they're not gonna, they're gonna go with the projects they got that are funded. Um, so it's a little, it's a little bit different. Just a question I have, um, in building up on what you asked, um, if the construction is starting in summer or May or whenever, we're not depend on the budget. We're the money is already going to be allocated, right? So it's not like if the budget fails, that project can't go ahead because we would have allocated the money already. It's from the fund balance. The budget right. wouldn't have would have maybe the three hundred thousand dollar. Uh, element to it, but it's not going to be the 1.5. Just, just. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think what will be helpful to tell the community is like five points I see. Here's the plan, the infrastructure plan of all the things that you can look at. Um, we have allocated 1.5 million, 300 will be added to the general budget. 2% uh, has been... Not added to the general budget, but likely, what, what I'm hearing them say is likely using money that's in fund balance. Okay, to be allocated. And then there are funds that are allocated, so I, a way to explain the fund balance, 2% for rainy days, which is, will be all the recommended projects that you have. Um, and then I think that, putting that in front porch forum, saying this is the conversation we're gonna have in two weeks. Uh, and for those of you on Facebook, <laughs> on Facebook and social media, and, uh, Jim said something about not having a precedent, but I think of like sending emails to to the community, but how else do we tell the community that this is the decision we're making, right? Like, I just have that question about all the process that is about this money. And I remember distinctly when we went through the SRO process that there was like, we have to wait, we have to hear from all the perspectives. And I just like wanna have that. Um, I'm not saying, like, people are gonna love this. I just want to offer the opportunity for people to weigh in, those who are not in the athletics. At the end of the day, I, I want the track too. I just want to make that uh, leap into how we make decisions in this board and plan a little better. No, I'm, and I'm you can good. disagree, Jim. But. No, we, can, we can put all of that on social media. I, I also want to point out that Front Porch Forum certainly found 
a lot of people who participated on the turf field who had nothing to do with the athletic community. Um, it, when, when people in Montpelier want to say something, they, they tend to, to find ways to say it pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, I think we can certainly you know, push this out as, as part of the budget process. There was a lot of misinformation. There were a lot of it's posts that they didn't have yeah. that, that were a lot of these questions like, you got all this money from us or family? Like there was a lot of misconception about how this money is allocated, yeah. these questions. And I think that's what I'm saying is like, let's give the transparency of the conversations to the community and they're gonna be happy about it. Yeah, and so. we could do that and there could still be a lot of misinformation. Um, it doesn't always magically work that way, but. Yeah, I, you know, throughout the budget process, we should definitely communicate um, what we're doing and, and why. Any further comments? Well, thank you, Andrew. It sounds like we will talk about it on the second, but it sounds like the board is edging in a direction. Yes? We're in the starting blocks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, Can I just ask oh, one question? Yeah. So I'm going to point it to you, Mia, just mm -hmm. because you're asking the question most, <laughs> not to single you out. What more would you need to see besides the fourth quarter report that states where the money, like I don't know what else you would need to see, and so mm -hmm. I want to get yeah. what you want to see. However, mm -hmm. at the same time, you've gotten this already, so what more would you need to see? Well, I appreciate you asking that. I think there was <coughs> stuff in there that I asked questions about that it was like, is, has this already been paid for or not? Is it actually still in the fund balance? So it was like, I can actually go look at it. If you could go look at it and send those questions yeah. to me, then that would be really helpful. Right. So then we can get that clarified for right. you. Right, because I would like to feel confident that that bottom number there in fund balance is as real as possible. Like the really what we have quote unquote in the bank and right now i'm because i felt like there was like oh it looks like it was spent but it's still showing here is about to be spent there was just some stuff that i could use some clarification on so i can send you those items yeah email. Take, a, try, take a look at that yes. and send it to us so christina and i can clarify that for you policy monitoring report <coughs> um so approve the C-12 prevention of sexual harassment as prohibited by Title IX. Um, do you have a motion to approve the policy monitoring report on that? You could <coughs> make a motion. That if you have questions, we could have it during discussion. I move to approve the policy monitoring report for policy C-12. Do you have a second? I second. Any discussion about the policy monitor report? No? Seeing none. Um, vote for approval. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion to adjourn. Uh, second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for a great discussion, everyone. Thank you all for still being here. Yes.